Why Florida State Recruiting is going to change with Javion Hilson's commitment. You are Locked On Seminoles, your daily podcast on the Florida State Seminoles. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome back into another episode of Locked On Seminoles. I'm your host, Brian Smith, and today's episode is going to be all about recruiting and J.B. on Hilson. If you take nothing else away from this show, know that Miami, Florida State, Auburn, Alabama, Georgia, anybody would have taken this kid, and he's a former Alabama commitment, so that's the good news. Please hit that like button, hit that subscribe. You can find this podcast wherever you get your podcast for free and on YouTube, part of the awesome Locked On Network, your team every single day. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. FanDuel. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place a $5 bet. Visit FanDuel.com forward slash locked on to get started. All right, here's the deal. Alabama loses Nick Saban. Obviously, they were going to have some repercussions. This young man, Javion Hilson from Coco High School, just over on the Space Coast, not all that far from Orlando, had already played, made his pledge to the Crimson Tide. He decommitted along with Wardle and knows how many other kids or other players that have transferred in that program is in some trouble. Florida State quickly picked up the pieces there. It's a kid they weren't going to give up on anyway. And to put it in perspective, he reminds me of Armando Blunt, the kid that signed with Miami that Miami and Florida State bought, battled for this last year. 6'3 and a half, 225, 230. He's a player I've known about for a long time. Every school in the country has recruited him. Here's why it's important, though. I, I was going through some of the stats, and I'll go over NCA numbers too, but looking at Florida State recruiting the last few years, and I've touched on this a few times, Florida State has not hit the home run the way they should have. They just simply have not. For a long time. And once Norvell and his staff got in, got in the building, they've made some inroads, especially with defensive tackles, but they've relied a lot on the portal and done well. That is not the best way to get to the promised land. You want to hit on the portal and in recruiting, not one or the other, both. You hear me say that all the time. If you watch this show, this is no different. Here's the deal. 2021 George Wilson, kid out of Virginia, didn't work out, ends up in the FCS. They got Lamont Green Jr. last year, but he was a freshman. You can't re really expect a whole lot. 22, they really didn't get much at all. Got the Hester kid out to Jacksonville. It didn't work out. And they don't have a pure edge in the 24 class. I mean, that's just not acceptable at a program like Florida State. My all-time favorite player, just generically forget school, uh, no bias, et cetera, to watch off the edge in all of college football. And I've been watching since the 80s is Bull Ware, played at Florida State. He was in the class of 95, was a three-year guy, and he headed to the league. You can't have enough pass rushers. So how does a program with the history of the Knowles not end up with more? Part of that was Norvell and his staff picking up the pieces and trying to figure it out because it was, let's be honest, when he took over, the program's roster wasn't where it needed to be. And part of it's still on them. They didn't hit what they should have by Florida State standard. There's no way around that. You know, I'll, I'll call it like it is. They did not win enough battles on the recruiting trail when, when he first got here to help change the program quicker. That's part of it. With Saban gone, they get this kid. And here's here's the real reason that I think that people are going to be happy with him. He's the rare kid that as a freshman, he's got another year of high school, he's class of 25, they can come in and play at Florida State. He can help set a trend. He should set a trend. Florida State is not a program that is in a in a spot right now that it is going to be that hard. They just ended fourth in the nation. And we'll get into these stats now with 46 sacks last year. That's tremendous. Obviously, Verse and they had plenty of players rotating in. The blitzing was great. They did a tremendous job. It's go out and sell it now. Alabama's gone. No excuse there. They're not going to be able to steal as many kids from the state of Florida. Florida's in shambles. Obviously, that program is is goofy and all over the place. You should be able to get in and take a lot of the kids from Central Florida all the way up to the South Georgia area, Thomasville and, you know, Valdosta, Moultrie, all those areas through there. 
There's tons of defensive linemen in this next, especially in the state of Georgia, in the class of 25. Florida State needs at least one more, at bare minimum, that is a pure weak side pass rusher in the class of 2025. Hilson can pro- play either one. It is, it, he's just gifted because when I watch his film and I've seen it, I don't know how many times I just enjoy watching his film. He'll overpower guys that are 260, 270, 280 with his first step. He gets into them and really disengages from them with just sheer power and low base. Low man wins. So he can play some strong side end down the road once he gets into college, but he's going to start on the weak side. But you need to start making up for some of these misses and also by doing so not rely on the portal as much. And then it's just a bonus the way it should be. I think Florida State getting him, especially right after it means he was probably going to pick Florida State. It hadn't been for Bama in the first place, but now the Saban's gone. So he sets that trend. What can they expect, though? Can you, you know, coming off a 13-0 regular season and ACC title game before they go to the bowl game, again, they, they should expect to get at least one more, right? Why wouldn't you? It's Florida State. Your program finally is at a point where the roster is headed in the right direction. At least one more. And that that's where I'm at right now. And I don't think it's too much to ask. To be honest, it really isn't. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about what sacks do. Some of the other teams, I've got some information here I, I put on my phone. They just show you the difference between winning and losing by just getting to the quarterback. Sometimes it's the basics, man. If you do not get after the quarterback, you do not get after the opportunity to win big. So with that, we're going to be talking a little bit about it here in just a second. All right, right now with FanDuel, this is the end of the regular season in the NFL, but there's still a time to get back in the action with FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook. Right now, new customers get 150 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place a $5 bet. That's 150 bucks in bonus bets, win or lose. The app is easy to use, and there are so many different ways to make it work with a bet, like using the same day game parlays, find bets in the new Explore tab, make a parlay in the Parlays Hub, the best way to find popular parlays, and more. So visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and make sure your first bet is a layup. FanDuel, official partner of the NFL. All right, let's talk about something else here that's really important to me, and that's just the overall viewpoint of college football. Let's use Penn State. Their offense was terrible last year. It stunk. Against Ohio State, their first 15 third downs, they were over. They got their first and only first down at the end of the game when Ohio State was just letting them throw the ball, do whatever, because they're just running out the clock. One for 16. And that team still ended up with the number one defense in some different categories, including sacks, I believe it was 49. If it wasn't for that pass rush, Penn State, they got beat by Ohio State and Michigan pretty soundly. They'd have lost a couple other games too. Even without, you know, they've got, they had a couple guys in the secondary going to the NFL draft, et cetera, and all that. Pass rush, pass rush, pass rush. They had multiple guys, some on the interior, not just exterior guys. They, they get after it, so I'm give them full credit. But that was the difference. Think about that. They were a 10 and 2 team with just a garbage offensive output. It's just true. Florida State was right behind them at fourth in the nation. Penn State was number one in sacks. When you also set the edge, it puts teams in a very difficult position on first and 10. And here's the other part of this. Penn State, Florida State, many others took advantage of this. When you go out and you know the other team is going to give your offensive tackles trouble in one-on-ones, it changes your play calling. You're going to chip meaning your tight end, your running back, your H-back, whatever, is going to come by and give a shoulder to the defensive end to slow him down to give the OT a better chance. And it's also probably going to change your route concepts a little bit on at least occasion and how quickly you want to get the ball out, change some of the play calls, makes it easier. Even in games where Penn State only got like one or two sacks, they still change the game and hike and throw, and those DBs could really pounce on short passes. Florida State did that as well. Ventral Cypress. Great DB, took advantage, having guys like Jared Verse over there. He was tremendous. Patrick Payton, yeah, if they doubled Verse or chipped him, same deal there. He had the opportunity to get after it. 
other teams had to release the football quicker. It's one of the reasons the DBs had a good year, and it's one of the reasons Florida State's overall pass defense was exceptional. They were one of the top programs in the country in many different ways, PBUs, et cetera. Florida State is on the cusp of being able to do that now every year. And while I still don't understand how well they do this, Florida State is incredible with their ability to use the portal and plug and play guys at multiple spots. And I think better than anybody in the country to be legitimate and honest, if they can just shrink that a little bit, even at one spot, like DN getting a kid like Hilson, that puts you in a position where you can focus more on other areas, where, whether it's quarterback, obviously they went and got DJU this year or whether it's an offensive tackle, whatever. And it's a critical position other than quarterback, which is always going to be the number one spot on the gridiron. I'm not debating that. You really have to do everything that you can to make sure there's an opportunity to get it done at the edge spot and change these play calls. Because if teams are just conservative, they're not concerned about you getting after their, their quarterback on first and second down, here they come. Guys like Hilson change that because, you know what, they're just going to run the ball. They're going to run the ball. They're not worried about third and five. They don't think you, you can do anything. You have Hilson, you can get after him more often. They have to take more chances. That's more interceptions, pass breakups, better field position, all the above. And, again, that's how Penn State won this year. Their offense was so bad it was hard to watch them play. But at the same time, they still finished in the top 10, in some people's opinion. Can Florida State consistently do that? I think they can. They were on the cusp of that this year. They weren't quite as good as Penn State's defense, but they were close. They were close. And if they're a little better linebacker recruiting, I think this is the trend that they're going to have to go with. They they have to get that spot, too, and I've talked about it as well. I'm not going to go on a complete tangent here, but Florida State is in that dynamic. The other program that I want to use the measurement with here is is Georgia. They don't pass rush like other teams do. They're much more conservative, but they're so good against the run and they're massive up front. Totally different concept and scheme, but they still usually have at least one guy like Michael Williams or whatever it may be that is coming off the edge that is their special player. Their defense doesn't work without it, even though it's a completely different scheme. Gotta have them. Georgia won back-to-back national titles because on third and six, well, they didn't necessarily get home a lot, their DBs were good. They always had somebody that gave the quarterback trouble. Michael Williams, a freshman, was one of them, but they have other guys too. If you can do it from a conservative two-gap, three-four defense with a bunch of really big guys up front and one true pass rusher, Florida State usually has two edges, and this past year was as good as it gets, in my opinion, with Peyton on one side and, of course, Verse on the other. If you're in that situation – I think Florida State should be conservatively three out of four years a college football playoff team, ACC or not. And I know that's the debate that Florida State fans want to talk about. I don't care about that so much. I just know that if you're great on defense, especially rushing the passer, you're going to up the ante and give yourself a better chance to win games. So with that, here's a couple other stats on some of the other teams. This is probably not going to surprise a whole lot of people. Penn State was first in sacks, 49. UCLA was seventh. That's a team that defensively, historically speaking, since the early 90s, they haven't had many teams that were very good on defense. And I'm being nice. They had a really good defense corner. SC just hired away. They were seventh in the nation, really changed their defense, and they even smacked like USC around, et cetera. Michigan, Missouri, and Bama all had 39 sacks. That was 11th. I wanted to use that to kind of give you a barometer. Those are all really good teams. And, of course, Michigan won it that – we're just on that cusp. If you're not over 35 sacks, you're probably not going to compete for the title. You're not. Again, Florida State, just for the record, was 46. They were fourth in the nation, so they were on par with that. The other part with this, if you look at the ACC, Clemson, Miami, NC State does a hell of a job. Obviously, the Knowles, it's a pretty good league with teams getting after the quarterback. And then there's Louisville, another team that was pretty high. If you just went through and ranked the teams in sacks and then you went through and looked at the final rankings in the Atlantic Coast Conference, wouldn't be a whole heck of a lot different. They're at least comparable. I mean, there's always a play here or there. Of course, Drake May was at North Carolina. He kind of changes things. That's a very special player. But for the most part, the top teams are going to be towards the top in sacks as well. Florida State, <coughs> excuse me, they're not going to go away from that, and they know it and they really put the emphasis on it to get it done this year. <coughs> Excuse me. But at the same time, 
they're not the only one. If they can finish first in the ACC, they should be at least yearly in the title game. That's just, just my opinion. So on the other side, I'm going to talk a little bit about recruiting with some of the other guys, uh, some of the other things that I think they need to do in this class to help it. But this is a good year in the state of Florida. I'm going to battle Miami. So we're going to talk about that next on Locked on Seminoles. All right. The big event that's coming up this coming weekend is what we call Battle Miami. It's Battle is a seven on seven organization. In my opinion, this first one, it happens every year. It's in Broward County, just outside of Miami, is the most important. Not only for Florida State, but for all the recruiting guys like myself across the nation, because teams from California, Texas, Arizona, Illinois, all over the place. Midwest Boom probably will be there, et cetera. South Florida Express, all these different teams. It's a chance for me and other recruiting analysts to go and check out all the talent. Even some guys like Hilson sometimes come because they play as tight ends, but that's not the point here. It's overall, this is the time, and I wanted to make this note that recruiting finally takes off. And since I started the show, it hasn't really been recruiting time. I started in August. Recruiting is basically done for the most part for the class of 24 by the time I took over. And now it's the full cycle starts over in January. This is the fun time for me. You get to see kids from quarterback, running back, slot, outside receivers, safeties, linebackers, everybody compete. Under Armour camps coming up. All the different things that you have to see to rank kids, do interviews, get photos, videos, etc. I'm going to be able to completely shift gears here on Locked on Seminoles with this episode coming up probably Sunday, Monday. Uh, the tournament is on Saturday and Sunday. I don't know how much of it will be great, but I, I again, the talent level will be tremendous, assuming the weather is good. It's it, Last I checked, the weather was supposed to be around 80 degrees in South Florida, so I certainly can't ask for better than that. And it's an opportunity for me to start giving you guys an idea how much effort Florida State's putting in with kids, whether or not they have a shot with a player, whether it's a kid from Miami Central, uh, like uh, Nation Montgomery just transferred there. It's a kid to Florida State, and everybody else is recruiting. It's a big-time receiver. He's buddies with Wayne McCoy. So I, I think the Knowles will have a chance there. And there's also something else that's really interesting about it. Florida State, they even did it this past year, the year before, Nicholson, their linebacker. They always seem to get one or two kids from California. Maybe it's a kid from Virginia or whatever. I might meet and interview somebody that mentions Florida State, and I had no idea they were even recruiting him. Because even since the days of Bobby Bowden in Tallahassee, the Knowles have done a pretty good job of getting kids from each coast. They don't get a ton. They don't get a ton but they'll get a few. This is probably one of about two different opportunities I'll have. Maybe if I go to Elite 11 finals in LA or maybe some tournament or something in Dallas or, or maybe the Under Armour event that's going to take place down in uh, Houston, something like that. Those are the only other chances I really get to see kids outside the region that the Knowles will recruit. And I like to compare them against the kids from the deep South, Georgia, Florida, Alabama, Mississippi, et cetera. The competitive, competitive nature of these kids down here is really hard to put into a finite type of terminology. I love it. It's one of the reasons I live down here. It's one of the reasons I scout down here. Obviously, there's more talent, but it's that competitive nature that I truly enjoy getting video and stuff. So I'll be doing some shorts, some other types of videos, just talking about the kids that are basic. It's going to, again, this, this podcast, I'll still do some of the live streams and all that, but this stuff is going to be the additional and it's more fun. I've always liked it. And I haven't really seen any reason not to do it, but this is the opportunity I've always kind of wanted in it. Being able to do the Florida State podcast gives me a very broad reach. I wouldn't have any other way to do it. So please make sure that you check these out. There'll be videos comparing like running backs in the passing game. There'll be quarterbacks talking about arm strength. There'll be opportunities to look at the different receivers, how, how different guys are deep ball threats compared to route runners, et cetera. Jamie French, for instance, a kid I know very well at Jacksonville Mandarin. He is a great player. Florida State is after him hard. They've already had Mike Norvell over to see him since Saban left, and he's decommitted from Alabama. I'm sure I'll probably talk to him this weekend, next weekend, whatever it is at different events, because I'll see Jamie several times between now and the end of spring. How does he compare to other guys? Right now, I would rank him the top receiver in the country. I like the Knowles' chances of getting him, and he is flat out an impact guy. And then finally, who's that hidden gem? 
that's what seven on seven often often gives me as well as the Under Armour camps and other things like the MVP camps. I might go to one or two of those. Who's that hidden gem going to be this year? I love talking about those kids. So you might see a video here at Locked on Seminoles that kind of goes into that. This is a kid you may not know much about, but he got a letter from Florida State or they saw him at this game when he scored three touchdowns. Those are some of the things that are coming this way. So once again, thank you very much. And I uh, hope everybody's having a good time. I just got done moving. So it's been pretty rough for me, but I got a little more to do. So anyway, please hit that like button and subscribe and come back and see us again soon. Thank you very much. Everybody have a great one.